We have two scripture readings for you today, one from Philippians and um, one from the Gospel of John. Philippians tells us, I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. In John 16, 33, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. You may be seated. Today we're going to talk about adversity. All of us, we know what adversity is. We faced it a lot in our lives. I'm going to start with telling you a story about an old farmer. Old <coughs> farmer's out in his fields working, putting around his property when he hears his mule starting to bay horrible. There's horrible noise from coming from his mule and he starts trying to follow the sound to find out what's going on. Well, he finds the mule. Come find out the mule had fallen down the shaft of an old abandoned well, and he was down there. Well, he had no way to get this poor mule out of there, so he decided the best thing to do is just basically fill in the hole. And you know, uh, so he gets the rest of the family and Don't they. Don't call Peter. That's the story. <laughs> so he gets the rest of the family and they grab shovels and they start digging and filling in this hole to try to end this whole situation. But uh, what they don't realize is as they're shoveling this off, every time a pile of dirt falls on the mule, he just shakes it off and it's settling to the floor. Well, what that's happening is the floor is getting higher and higher. And he keeps stepping up. So they keep shoveling in, not realizing what's going on. It makes you know the mule just steps out of the, out of the well to safety. Now, we all face adversity. It's not a question of whether or not we're going to face adversity. It's a question of how we're going to deal with it. Clearly the mule found a way to deal with it. He's got dirt going on him. They're going to bury him. And he just used it to step out. How many of you know who Frederick Nietzsche is? Can everybody hear me okay? No? I'm going to turn this up now. Frederick Nietzsche is a philosopher. He's actually kind of a brutal philosopher, really. Okay, the Nazi used a lot of his, uh, his teachings in their philosophy. So it's not somebody you really kind of want to emulate. And he was an atheist on top of that. But he did say something that stuck with me once, and I think it's very true when you're dealing with adversity. That which does not kill us makes us stronger. It become a very famous saying. But it's also very, very true. Now on the other side of that, there's another philosopher, a missionary named Oswald Chambers. And he once wrote, and I quote, suffering is the heritage of the bad, of the penitent, and of the Son of God. Each one ends at the cross. The bad thief was crucified, the penitent thief was crucified, and the Son of God was crucified. By this we know the widespread heritage of our suffering. On Memorial Day weekend, um, my son, who most of you know is in the Army, um, he is now retiring. It's really disgusting that my son can retire before I can. Um, but anyway, he's, <laughs> he's retiring from the Army and moving to Phoenix. But this past Memorial Day weekend, he is uh, stationed at West Point. He took on a challenge to, uh, as a tribute to fallen uh, soldiers who have been killed, uh, those who have been injured. Uh, and so this challenge was he was going to run one, approximately 1.1 mile every hour for 24 hours. 
And basically what this challenge is, is actually preparing you for a marathon, because it comes out to 26 miles, a little over that. Um, so he did this marathon, and because of the fact that, um, of course, he can run, I mean, to run 1.1 mile would take me like probably all day. But anyway, for him, it only takes about 15 to 20 minutes. So, um, so he had a lot of time each hour to think. And after he completed this challenge, he had posted a video on Facebook. And he talked about during this, the downtime of each hour, he had a lot of time to think. And especially in the nighttime hours of that 24 hour period when his family was asleep, um, he said he got to thinking a lot about his life and his army career and deployments, um, what's happening now in the world with the COVID-19 and, and everything. Um, and he said he started thinking about adversity. He said he asked himself if he had truly faced adversity. And the answer to himself was no. Now, I was absolutely shocked to hear this because, not just because he's my son, but this is a man who has been through three deployments, in, injured in a bombing in one of those deployments, lost a team member, um, and suffered for about a year some pretty bad PTSD from that bombing. So, for me, I'm thinking, oh yeah, Honey, you, you've definitely faced adversity. But he went on to say that adversity is, well, and at first, okay, I thought, all right, maybe I'm just stupid and I don't really know what it means, you know, so maybe I'm, I'm thinking of the, the, a wrong word or something. So I looked it up in the dictionary and it does really mean exactly what I thought it did. You know, it's, it's difficulties or misfortune. There's a number of different words, you know, that you can say adversity is. Um, but he explained that this was something that is very personal, and each person has to answer that for themselves of, have you been through adversity? So it got me to kind of thinking about it in my lifetime and through different marriages and things that have happened in my life. And I started thinking about it and I've come to some conclusions about adversity. I can remember as a single mom back in my mostly 20s, um, Something that would happen. I mean, I would call my parents. I lived here. They lived in Idaho. My toilet would back up. My sink would back up. I had no money. <laughs> I couldn't call a plumber. It's not like my ex-husband was going to come help me. Um, and I would just call my parents in absolute panic and tears. I mean, it was like devastating for me. This was the end of the world. I don't know what to do. And my parents were great. They were commiserating, honey, we're sorry. Find out what a plumber costs. We'll mail you the money. Don't worry about it. It's all going to work out. And then they would say, oh, shoot, did we tell you about so-and-so? His wife died of cancer and left him with four children under the age of five. He's having to work three jobs. And I went, oh, no, you didn't tell me about him. Now I feel really stupid for complaining about my backed up sink. <laughs> you know, and this worked for me. I mean, because I would. I would start feeling really, really bad, you know, about me complaining about my stuff. And here's this poor guy out there that is really facing awful challenges in his life. So when I was in the hospital this last April, it was not a scheduled thing. It was, they called me and said, you need to come in. Sumner dropped me off at the front door. I was facing surgery the next day. 
I was going to be in the hospital. Well, I ended up being in the hospital for eight days. Sumner would call me every day and constantly complain how horrible this was for him. That he just, he couldn't stand the fact that he couldn't be there with me. And it was frustrating. And it was just horrible for him. And at the time, I wanted to slap him. <laughs> because I'm like, dude, you're not the one in the hospital. You're not the one having to go through surgery alone. You're not the one having to go for six days with nothing, including water, just on IV fluids. You can go out to eat. You can see people, you know. I didn't tell him that. I think I shared it with Pat, though, because <laughs> Pat would call and check on me, and I'd say, I'm going to kill my husband when I get out of here. <laughs> but at the time, I got to thinking, of course, so being in a hospital bed, you have a lot of time to think as well. Um, I realized that just because I was going through my own different adversity at that time did not mean that his, what he was going through, should be diminished at all. That was what he was going through in his life. And in his heart, in his mind. So I think that, you know, I, I now that I'm healed up, I think, and this is how why I think my son answered the way he did. I look back on this time and it's like, oh, no, that wasn't so bad. You know, I could, you know, if I had to do that again, I could. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't nearly as bad as I thought it was at the time. And, and now that I'm healed in here, I'm, I'm more thinking about, wow, there's people in the hospital that are still there dying of COVID, not able to have family, you know, healthcare workers being the only people that are with them or trying to facilitate videos with their family while this poor patient says goodbye and how emotional that is. My heart was going out for all the moms going through labor and having their babies totally alone and their husbands, the dads, who could not share in that miracle of birth of their child. And I think sometimes we end up occasionally downplaying other people's <coughs> adversities. Bless you. And and sometimes I think we even downplay our own adversities. Now, what my parents used to do, I don't think people do it intentionally, but yeah, my parents used to try and remind me to be a little more positive, to realize how truly blessed I was by bringing up someone who was really going through tougher times than I was. Um, and for some people, that works really well. But it can also backfire on you. So I think that that is something, too, as Christians, we really, really need to be very, I think, a lot more understanding of what other people are going through, even though we might feel in our lives that, oh, well, that's not so bad. I've been through worse things than that, you know. No, we need to be a lot more understanding, and, that, and that's difficult. As humans, that is difficult, especially depending, like when I was in the hospital, what your state of mind is at the time. Um, sometimes all you can do is listen. You can't fix it. You can't really make it better, but you can listen and be there. This... From, I think from the age you're even toddlers, everybody goes through adversity. Toddlers are devastated over the loss of a toy. And as a parent, you're looking at them going, we'll replace it, don't worry. But to that toddler, that is the end of the world. 
Teenagers are devastated by a breakup or not getting invited to prom or any number of things. For those of you who have been parents of teenagers, you know. Um, and adults, they're devastated by the loss of a spouse, the loss of a job, divorce, cancer, abuse of childhoods, abuse of relationships, any number of things. And as we get older, our adversities get different. They become different. This COVID pandemic, I think, has affected people very differently and in different ways. Um, for some, it's been a good thing. I think it's made people slow down, maybe spend a little more time with God, spend a little more time in prayer, more time with your children, with your family. I mean, let's face it, we live in a very hurried, busy life. And this has made us stop. Now, for others, quite the opposite is true. Someone who is stuck at home with an abusive spouse or an abusive parent. This can be absolute hell for them. For others, the silence and the loneliness is absolutely devastating. For some, it could be welcoming because their lives are so busy, they want silence. And I think for some, it's really surprised them as to how it's affected them. I know it's, it's surprised me. If any of you, and I think most of you out there know me fairly well, um, I'm, I'm the social butterfly. He's the one, he likes to stay home and not be around anybody. He's very happy with that. I'm not, I love being around people. And outside of our church's social life and being able to socialize with all you guys on Wednesday nights, our lives haven't changed. And that scared me a little bit. I think I've just been living with him like way too long because I've been fine with this. It hasn't really bothered me at all. So it's like, okay, this is surprising because I would have thought it would really, really bug me. But the one constant in all of this is that no matter what anyone thinks of the severity of the adversity you're going through, Christ cares. He cares for the toddler that's lost that toy he cares for the teenager who's devastated for any number of reasons, and believe me, it can be extremely minor to you, but to that teenager, it is the end of the world. And for the adults who sometimes cannot even put a finger on exactly what they're fighting, but they know it's a huge battle, whatever it is. You may not be able to actually verbalize it. But it's a battle that you're going through. Christ cares about the small and large things in our lives. And he will always see us through it. Even though at times, you may feel he is just nowhere to be found. Trust me, he's there. We'll get through this pandemic just as we have survived flus, world wars, other natural disasters, and all kinds of adversities. In John 16, that I had read, Christ is telling his disciples, and he's not saying maybe, he's telling them, this is 100%, there will be trouble in your lives. There's going to be trouble in our lives but to be at peace, for he has overcome all of that. And he has faced the greatest adversity for all of us, to have salvation and everlasting life. So don't ever stop sharing your troubles with Jesus. 
no matter how small they might seem to be, he wants to know, and he's there to be with you every step of the way. She was talking about running a mile and 1.1 mile. You want to see me run? You'd have to judge how fast the bear chasing me is. <laughs> That's what it would take to get me to do it. And actually, she's not entirely true. I like getting out as much as the next person. I just don't like people. <laughs> That's not true about you guys. You guys are family. You, know, you guys don't take that. Uh, I'm the youngest of uh, three children. I have two older sisters. Esther, who's the oldest, and Paula, the middle child, and then me. One's seven years older than me, and one's five years older than me. And um, we all grew up very, very close to our father. We were very tight with, with Dad. We really were. But now, me and Esther, we were, in our youth, we were kind of knuckleheads, and we did things. Sometimes they weren't all that bright. So our lives were kind of like this. You know, you have ups and downs, you face adversity. Uh, and and um, now Paula, in the middle, oh, good Lord, no, her life was like this. Just fine, all the way through. I mean, I swear, she could have been a poster child for Betty Crocker, uh, husband, three children. Then our dad got sick in the late 80s. He was diagnosed with cancer in 1986. And uh, ups and downs with that, but to give you an idea how, I mean, Esther, Paula and her husband lived across the street from my parents. They bought a house across the street after they got married. So they never, she never even really left home. Well, then after Dad got sick, though, you know, that, that progressed, you know, how cancer is. Well, he was actually in hospice at the house, and he was at one point even in and out of a coma. It was really pretty, getting pretty close to that time frame. I was in the Army at the time, I was stationed at Fort Bragg, so I was not at home. Well, all this is going on, one day her husband of 22 years and the father of her three children came home from work, told her he was in love with somebody else, and he packed his clothes and he left. All this going on at the same time, my father is clearly you know, um, on his deathbed. She couldn't handle it, she fell apart, and I do mean fell apart. She was actually a shut-in for a long time. Created a lot of, created some animosity, I should say, between uh, her and the oldest, my oldest sister, and even my mother, to a big extent, because uh, Paula just wasn't capable of doing anything. I mean, nobody could really depend on her for anything during this time frame. And actually, even to an extent, I was, I was upset about it. When, um, when my father actually passed away, I was in Honduras. I deployed to Honduras. And so they flew me back, and um, like I said, she just couldn't deal with anything. For a long time, people in the family held that against her, and I don't know why. I mean, it's just that she wasn't prepared for it. All of us go through those ups and downs in our lives, and actually it trains you. You have to understand a couple things about adversity. No one is exempt. At some point in your life, I don't care how perfectly it's going, you're going to face adversity. You're gonna face those trials. We've all heard that adversity builds character. Well, you know, in a way, that's true. After all that incident, after that, and after Paula came out the other side of that, there's probably not much she can handle that. Yeah, she's a cancer survivor herself and has gone through a double mastectomy. So she's learned. Of course, it didn't happen until she was in her 40s, but she did learn adversity. And she learned how to conquer each of it. And she's come through like a, like a champ now. Um, but it does build character. I mean, I'm gonna be 66 years old soon. And I look back at my life and even the major mistakes and those ups and downs, you know what, I wouldn't trade them because it's all part of what I became. And I'm actually okay with myself at this point in my life. I came out of it okay. So it does build character. If you channel it right, you can turn it into a positive. There's something else to keep in mind. Our sufferings and those, those adversities that we face, they are temporary. If you just hang in there, you know, don't get, don't get discouraged. Don't get to the point where you feel like you've just had it and you're going to give up. That accomplishes nothing. But it's all temporary. 
there is a point, I know they always say there's a point where it's going to, it is actually going to get better. It really truly does. You know, the sermons are the um, scriptures that we read today. One thing that they put out, one thing that John said in, in, uh, in Philippians, they tell you is that you can get strength from God. He will help you come out that other side. That is somebody you can always count on. His love is there and his strength is there. And you can always, always count on that. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much, Lord. We thank you for walking with us through every adversity in our lives. No matter how small or how large, we know that you're there. We ask, Lord, that you be with all those who maybe is not, they're not feeling your presence, or they're not calling on you to help them through it. We ask, Lord, that you give them strength and comfort. In Christ's holy name, amen.